Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Floro, and I'm the head of business development across the Asian region at FE Fun Info. On behalf of FE Fun Info, I'd like you to welcome to welcome you to our Better Connected 2022 event. Unfortunately, due to the current circumstances, we're welcoming you in a virtual capacity again this year. Nonetheless, we're very excited to be bringing you a packed agenda with expert panelists and speakers from some of the leading global players in fund management and distribution to discuss the current issues impacting global fund distribution. Before we dive into the event agenda, many of you will know FE Fund Info as a leader in fund data and technology whose aim is to make the fund industry better connected and better informed. Our unique position in the industry allows us to join the dots between fund managers, distributors, financial advisors, and end investors, helping all participants become more efficient and better informed. Our vision is to become the world's most trusted creator, provider, and connector of fund information, enabling advice, powering efficient distribution, and delivering insight. We have two complementary hubs serving this connected ecosystem with our core capabilities in data, technology, and the expertise of our people at the very heart of what we do. And we are incredibly proud to partner with 40 of the top 50 global asset managers today. Our ever-growing network of distributors comprised of platform providers, wealth managers, and other vendors also partner with FE Fund Info to access quality content to feed into their respective platforms and fund selection tools. And today, we are excited to have a few of our key partners joining us on your screens, including a couple of expert contributors from FE Fund Info. Today, you will hear from Mikkel Bates, who will give us an update on ESG regulatory changes impacting Hong Kong and Singapore. We will then be provided with an introduction to open funds by Charlie Duffin. Charlie will be followed by our keynote speaker, Peter Stein, who will be covering the important role of data in promoting ESG and determining the suitability of products for clients. Following on from Peter, Sebastian Brinkman will present on na navigating ESG reporting challenges. And finally, our panelists, Frederick Chu, Hilary Sue and Shelley Yu will be discussing how groups across the industry are integrating sustainability factors in fund distribution. Before we continue, I'd like to encourage you to participate in our live Q&A. You can do this by selecting the questions pane or icon in the toolbar and entering your question. We will address as many questions as we can at the end of each speaker's presentation. Our first segment will be brought to you by Mikkel Bates. Mikkel is the regulatory manager at FE Fund Info, where he frequently consults fund managers and distributors on navigating regulatory changes and requirements and their impact on fund operations, compliance, and marketing functions. Prior to this role, he had many years experience in institutional and wholesale marketing and distribution within the asset management industry across the UK and Europe. He has dealt firsthand with increasing regulation on the industry and supports initiatives towards greater meaningful transparency for consumers through active involvement in industry working groups, hosting industry roundtables, and acting as a thought leader. So over to you, Michael. Thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to keep this presentation quite high level, uh, looking first at Hong Kong and Singapore disclosures then the first draft of the ASEAN taxonomy, and then I'll finish off with a few points on what's happening in some other key markets. So starting with Hong Kong, in June last year, the SFC issued a circular to managers of authorized DSG funds, updating its original 2019 circular uh, and taking another step on the road to improving the comp comparability and transparency of ESG fund disclosures. Some details have remained unchanged since the 2019 circular, and the 2021 requirements took effect at the beginning of this year, 2022. The circular is written as guidance with lots of instances of what funds should do, but you can be sure they're really instructions on what need to be followed. What are classed as ESG funds are defined as those that incorporate ESG factors as their key investment focus and reflect this in the objective and strategy but the SFC accepts that there are many different versions of such funds. And the first requirement is, as it always has been for all funds, that the fund name must not be misleading. So any reference to ESG or similar in the name must reflect any ESG features and not exaggerate these. The SFC has a central database of ESG funds accessible through its website, 
And there are several disclosures these funds need to make in their offering documents, such as what type of ESG focus the fund has, how it integrates that version of ESG into its investment strategy, what proportion of its assets will be in line with its ESG features, whether it has an ESG reference benchmark where investors can find further information about the ESG nature of the fund, and the risk associated with its ESG focus, such as restricting the universe it can invest in. There's also additional guidance for climate funds, which are those which aim, for example, for a lower carbon footprint than a reference benchmark, or contribute to cutting down greenhouse gas emissions, or positively contribute towards climate change mitigation or adaptation. These funds should consider specific climate metrics, such as greenhouse gas emissions, weighted average carbon intensity, or the revenue generated from CapEx or OpEx on factors contributing positively to those climate issues. And if they have a reference benchmark, they need to explain its relevance and how it differs from a traditional one. Then, at least annually, an ESG fund should include in its annual report information on how it is done against its ESG focus, such as the proportion of the fund in line with that focus, how it's performed against its ESG benchmark index, what actions it's taken to achieve its focus, and so on. And after the first such report, future reports must include a comparison with previous periods. And then finally, use its funds that meet the reporting requirements of the EU Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation will be deemed to have satisfied their initial and ongoing disclosure requirements, and they'll be classed as use its ESG funds. Last August, the SFC published the, the findings from its consultation into the management and disclosure of climate related risks and came up with a set of reporting requirements. These can be sliced and diced in lots of ways, but essentially there are baseline and enhanced disclosures, which need to be made at entity and fund level, and which depend on whether the firm is a large fund manager or not. In other words, whether it has over $8 billion of assets. So to start with the baseline requirements, these apply to all fund groups and consist of setting roles and responsibilities for the board and senior management. Investment managers need to identify, assess, and factor in climate-related risks or explain why they may not be relevant, which could be at either the fund or entity level. Disclosures should be proportionate to the extent to which climate risks are taken into account, and these disclosures should be available for investors on the company website. The so baseline disclosures for large fund managers come in on the 20th of August, and then they step up to the enhanced disclosures three months later on the 20th of November, which happens to be the date that baseline disclosures kick in for the smaller fund groups. For the enhanced disclosures, managers in scope will need to consider the resilience of their funds under different climate scenarios and where the data is available or can be estimated, disclose scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions of the investments in their funds. At the entity level, large fund managers need to disclose their engagement policy and show how material climate risks are managed in practice. And these enhanced disclosures come in from the first year end starting after 20th of November. For, yeah. So moving now to Singapore, <clears throat> I'm going to focus on two documents issued by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. First, the guidelines for asset managers on environmental risk management, which is published in 2020. And in a moment, I'll talk about the information paper last, published last month. So the guidelines apply to both funds and mandates, and MASS makes several concessions for differences between scale, scope, and business model of managers and their portfolios. And they also make it clear that the guidelines are neither prescriptive nor exhaustive. While investee companies can both affect and be affected by the environment, the guidelines only apply to the financial and reputational impact of environmental risks on portfolios. MASS separates environmental risks into physical risks, such as the impact of weather events or rising sea levels on the ability of a company to continue to operate, and transition risks the impact on a company's profitability and valuation of the transition, either by the company or its customers, to a low carbon economy. So the onus is being put on boards and senior management to identify environmental risks and opportunities over the short and long term, and articulate the asset manager's approach for each asset class it manages, taking different risks into account when assessing the long term sustainability of those asset classes, and all appropriate to the nature, scale and complexity of the assets. Systems should be put in place to monitor the risks on an ongoing basis, where these are material, reassessing the risks in the light of any developments, whether natural or legal, 
and making changes to the portfolio when necessary or escalating any concerns through the company's escalation process. Asset managers should conduct scenario analysis where they deem the environmental risk to be material, incorporating physical and transition risks across a range of climate scenarios, not just different temperature conditions. There is also a section in the guidelines on stewardship with an emphasis on engagement, proxy voting and collaboration to drive positive change. Some of the topics suggested for engagement include raising environmental issues with investee companies, influencing them to better manage and mitigate environmental risk, supplementing the official risk disclosures issued by those investee companies, and encouraging them to provide relevant and timely environmental risk data. But it's clear there are many other ways they could engage as well. Now, while these guidelines came into force earlier this month, as we'll see on the next slide, Mass published an information paper only a month ago on how asset managers are progressing towards implementation. As is the way pretty much the world over, they found good progress in some areas and other areas where there was room for improvement. Most groups were seen to accept and recognize the urgency of the risks to environment. Many have signed up to the UNPRI, taken on staff with relevant skills and even started to make disclosures. But the areas for improvement include things like having quantitative targets for different time periods, embedding top-down and bottom-up risk assessment across all asset classes and strategies they manage, aligning their portfolios with climate goals, and using engagement with investee companies to improve their environmental risk profiles and taking action when necessary. The paper divided up the areas that managers need to focus on into those shown here. And in the interest of time, I'll just expand on one or two of them. I've already talked about stewardship and scenario analysis, so I'll go into more detail first on portfolio risk management. Mass requires managers to systematically monitor, assess, and manage the actual and potential impact of environmental risks on their portfolios. They need to check that environmental risk ratings reflect the risks that they believe the investee companies are exposed to. They must keep up to date with ratings where third party providers update them or where a review may be triggered and engage with companies to collect their own ESG data rather than relying on third party supplied data. They should also be on constant lookout for any evidence of greenwashing. Then on disclosure, for instance, they must be consistent, comparable, reliable, and they must be in line with international standards, such as the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure or TCFD, or the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standard Board's reporting standards when they eventually come into effect. The Stock Exchange has set out a roadmap for listed issuers based on the TCFD recommendations, and Mass will be producing a similar roadmap for financial institutions in line with global sustainability reporting standards. And that's probably a good point at which to move on to the first draft of the ASEAN taxonomy, as Singapore is part of that. Now this slide, I don't know if anyone can see on their screen what it says, but it comes from the taxonomy, which is published last November. And what it shows is the disparity between some of the climate goals of the ASEAN member states. For example, Myanmar's target of reducing coal in power generation by around three quarters, reducing deforestation by 25% and increasing renewable power to over 50%. Then you have Vietnam, for instance, with a targeted reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of 9% by 2030, compared to the BDAU scenario. Other targets for reductions in greenhouse gas emissions range from around 20% to over 60%. And the drivers for the economies are very diverse from manufacturing to agriculture to fossil fuels. So the taxonomy aims to meet several goals. It must work alongside other taxonomies around the region and around the world. It must take account of all the nat these national differences among member states, and it must allow for any member state to produce their own taxonomy. So, Essentially, the, the ASEAN taxonomy is an overarching guide which sets out a common language for sustainability. And like other taxonomies, it's focused initially on climate related issues before looking to add other ESG factors later. And on the next slide here, we see the five high level principles established by the ASEAN taxonomy board, which was convened from existing committees among member states to draft the taxonomy. These principles are intended to cater for the different stages of the 10 economies, financial systems and transition paths. The first two principles, providing a common language and working with other taxonomies have already been covered. 
And the other key one really is principle four, which talks about providing a framework as opposed to a detailed prescription as some other taxonomies try to do. You may not be surprised, given all that, to see that the taxonomy has been produced as a two-tier concept with a core foundation framework and what they call a plus standard. The foundation framework applies to all member states, financial sector companies, and other businesses. Economic activities must fulfill at least one of the four environmental objectives of climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation, protection of, of healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, and transition to a circular economy. Then on top of that, they must satisfy both the, what they call essential criteria. So do no significant harm to any of the other three objectives or to the broader environment and what they're calling remedial efforts to transition, which means that actions to mitigate the impact of climate change should try to anticipate and avoid the impacts from the outset. And if they can't avoid them, minimize the impacts to an acceptable level. If they manage all that, they'll be classified as green under the taxonomy. If they meet an environmental objective but can't claim to do no significant harm, but are taking steps to improve on that, they'll be amber. And if they aren't even taking those steps, they'll be classed as red. Moving on to tier two, the plus standard, which gives guidance on qualifying taxonomy alignment by economic activity. The expectation is that future versions of the taxonomy will broaden the base of economic activities, but version one has six focus sectors. And these are agriculture, manufacturing, energy, transport, construction, and water. Within each of these, the taxonomy proposes red and green activities and a suggested model for acceptable thresholds based on decarbonization pathways. Probably the most important takeaway from the taxonomy is that it will evolve and grow to include more industries and depending on progress towards alignment. I'd now like to move finally onto a very quick look at what's happening elsewhere in the world. The EU was the first up with its ESG taxonomy, which is good and bad. It means it set the standard for others to compare themselves against and to measure their compatibility, but it also means it had nothing to, to base itself on. This taxonomy has six environmental objectives, and they've so far produced details for what exactly counts as sustainable for the first two, Again, climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation, consistent with the ASEAN taxonomy, and the other four are due later this year. The EU also published the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation with prescribed disclosure templates for pre-contractual and periodic reports and for disclosure of principal adverse impacts. And although this regulation was all about the disclosure required, it has become a de facto classification system for funds in the EU as it set out the disclosure requirements for what are traditional funds, known as Article 6, would have become classes light green funds, which are Article 8, and dark green or impact funds, which are Article 9. This has led to a rush of funds classifying themselves as Article 8, so they can be on the radar of investors looking for sustainable funds. The EU is also the only region so far to focus on the concept of double materiality, whereby companies need to consider not only the impact of climate change on their own sustainability and their valuation, but what effect their activities are having on the environment and climate change. The UK has been less prescriptive so far, with the Treasury requiring listed corporates, asset managers and asset owners to disclose metrics in line with the TCFD recommendations. The UK regulator, the FCA, published a discussion paper last year on sustainability disclosure requirements and a labeling scheme for funds, both green and traditional, and it's expected to publish the next stage of this next month. It's also said that the TCFD recommendations will be replaced by the broader standards coming from the ISSB as they focus on more than just climate. And last but not least, the SEC in the US has published proposals to mandate disclosures for funds to spell out their ESG investments in an attempt to clamp down on greenwashing. Like the SFDR, the disclosures would depend on whether the fund is categorized as an integration fund with little involvement in ESG, ESG focused, relying on one or more ESG factors, or impact designed to achieve a specific ESG goal. So again, three stages of, of ESG rating. But this has been complicated recently by the fact that states starting with West Virginia have started blacklisting asset managers that actively boycott fossil fuel companies 
with what's state level anti-ESG investing laws. And 24 US state attorneys have written to the SEC demanding that it halts work on its climate disclosure rules as they claim the SEC is overstepping its authority with what they call an ill-advised misadventure into environmental regulation. And on that little bombshell, I'll hand you back to Jeff to continue with the conference. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for giving us an important update on the latest to changes to ESG regulation. So up next, we have Charlie Duffin, who will give us an overview of open funds. Charlie is the Data Design and Definition Manager at FE Fund Info, who is part of the Open Funds Committee, where he plays a significant role defining data concepts and standards to help streamline the transmission of data across the industry. If you have any questions for Charlie during his presentation, please enter these in the questions page. page sorry. Take it away, Charlie. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, as Jeff said, I'll be going over a brief introduction to open funds, um, but keeping it much like Michael's very high level. Uh, so anyone who's familiar with open funds already should know most of this. Um, and as Jeff says, if you have any more in-depth questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, so we'll be starting with what open funds is, moving into some more details of, of how it works, uh, and then ending with some recent developments. So for anyone not already familiar, open funds is a data standard. Um, it does not hold data, it does not import data or distribute data, it just acts as a dictionary of terms. Uh, it's open source, so anyone can use it without paying for the standard or anything like that. Uh, and its aim is just to standardize the uh, data terms we all use in the fund industry. It's primarily driven by fund distributors um, who are, <laughs> Who, for whom it's uh, vital to have everyone speaking the same language when it comes to fund data. Uh, it's an association of members. It is not driven by any one single member. It is a committee of people all working together to achieve the same aim. Uh, and the, the most key thing about open funds is its open funds identifier. Any more information on this? Uh, and if you do want to contact me after the uh, session uh, can be found on openfunds.org and there's also contact details there. So broadly speaking how open funds works is just a large set of fields that are all published in a field list on our website. Uh, each of these fields has a unique number and a definition uh, and codification for the field. Uh, for any particularly complex fields that open funds publishes there is often extra information on the website in the form of a white paper. These will generally be prepared by a working group of members to come up with this um, explanation of the field. So this is the open funds identifier earlier referenced. Uh, it's made up of several parts and they're, they're all standardized in the same way. Uh, so from the top, every open funds identifier starts with OF for open funds. It's then followed by two letters denoting the type of data, broadly speaking, that the, uh, the data field entails. So we have static, dynamic, uh, recently introduced portfolio holdings data for full portfolio holdings. Then there is a six digit number, which is the unique number of the field. So each field will have a different number here, which uh, can identify it from all of the others. So these aren't repeated, these aren't reused. This is always unique. Uh, the last two parts shown here are just optional extras, so for some fields. Uh, some particularly narrative fields where different languages can affect it, there can be a language tag showing uh, the same field in different languages, in English, German, um, Mandarin, that sort of thing. Uh, and then the last one is the most rarely used part of the identifier. Again, most identifiers don't have this, which is the recipient identifier. Uh, and that's for any data such as trailer fees that is specific to certain recipients uh, to identify who this data is relevant to. Now, this might be a touch smaller over on the screen, uh, so I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but this is an idea of what the open funds fields look like on our website. Um, it's broken up into sections that you can see on the left. Uh, where each chunk of the uh, data catalogue 
is say general information, share class information, fees and expenses, that sort of thing. Uh, and then each field itself has the ID mentioned before, a field name, which isn't necessarily unique in the same way an ID is, but should generally be, um, to give some explanation of what content of the field is. It's then got a field tag, which we've recently overhauled in a, in a version, which should give some uh, easily searchable information about the field, what type of data is in it, what countries it applies to, that sort of thing. Uh, it's followed up by the field level, which is an indicator of what hierarchical level this would sit on a database. This is only a recommendation. Anyone using Open Funds is free to define their database how they wish. Uh, but Open Funds here gives a recommendation of what level we think the field is. That's followed by the data type of the field. I think Open Funds has six different data types, um, string, date, uh, number, that sort of thing. In addition to that, you've got a link reference, which one of these fields has, which shows if this field is linked to another field uh, and defined in any way by that field. So a field that say, uh, we often have Boolean fields that say, does this field need this, does this fund need this fee? And then the fee itself will be linked to that field. Uh, also, there is the version that the field was introduced with. Uh, open funds is versioned um, and the, the fields are not individually versioned. They are just associated with an all, overall version of the standard. Uh, and then lastly, we have the description of the field there and the values it may contain and an example. Uh, in both the examples we have here, there is no set list of values because these are both um, text fields. But on fields where there are a set list of values, that will be listed here. Finally, we have the uh, recent developments in the standard. Um, so usually what Open Funds aims for is to have two regular versions per year. Uh, as you can see from this list of the past year, it's been a bit busier than that uh, due to all the developments. So a year ago now, last June, there was a regular version 1.27. This was the first introduction of the full portfolio holdings fields I mentioned earlier. Uh, it also included the Hong Kong Mutual Recognition of Funds field, uh, requested by, I believe, FE Fund Info at the time, uh, and various other member requests included in that version. Uh, then in between that and the next full version, we had a minor version where we overhauled all of the field tags to make them more useful for members trying to search for a certain field. So if you open the Excel version of the data standard, you can then filter by these tags to find the fields you're looking for. If you were, for example, only looking for fields relevant to certain countries or certain data types, you could filter on these tags. Uh, and it's intended to help users when creating themselves a template of uh, data fields out of the enormous overall set to filter down to a more relevant um, smaller field set. Then our next uh, full version after that was in March of this year, which was primarily concerned around uh, the changes from EPT, uh, which is the European PRIPS template version two and the European MIFID template version four. It also contained a number of other member requests, including as referenced there, the Hong Kong insurance link security fields that came from the Private Wealth Management Association. Um, any, any member or non-member can contact us to request any fields to be put in a version. Um, Open Funds isn't restricted. We rely on our members for, for new field data. Uh, so we only tend to have a field when someone has asked for this data. Um, recently in the uh, ACN region, we've had requests from mostly FE Fund Info and the PWMA, but we are open to requests from anyone. Then the future versions we've got coming up, uh, there is one being released late, later this month, which is the uh, an addendum to version 128, just for the European ESG template fields. Uh, and then finally, later this year, we'll have our next full version um, in September, which will be mixed purpose, extending the full portfolio holdings field set and a variety of other member requests that we've had.
Uh, and that brief run through concludes everything for me, but uh, please let me know any questions you'd like to ask. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Peter Stein. Uh, Peter is CEO and Managing Director of Private Wealth Management Association, an industry association whose mission is to foster the growth and the development of the private wealth management industry in Hong Kong. In this role, he is responsible for all aspects of the association's activities and strategy. Prior to joining PWMA in December 2016, Peter worked for UBS AG, where he served as Head of Regulatory Advisory and Relations Asia Pacific, and before that as Head of Group Governmental Affairs for Asia Pacific. Until 2011, Peter was a senior editor and reporter in Hong Kong with the, the Wall Street Journal, where he worked for more than 20 years, including as the journal's Hong Kong bureau chief and as a managing editor of the journal's Asian edition. Today, Peter is going to provide us with an insight into the use of data in private wealth management to determine the suitability of products for clients and promote ESG. Please feel free to ask Peter any questions in the questions pane, and we'll get to these at the end of his presentation. Um, welcome, Peter. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, so, um, you've already explained uh, what PWMA does, and as Charlie just mentioned, um, we have worked with open funds a number of times in the past um, on um, uh, trying to um, get templates that are useful for our members in order to um, try and identify uh, funds um, through different lenses. So I'm, I'm actually gonna talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. Uh, I will talk about several use cases for data in the, uh, in the world of private wealth management, and I'm gonna focus in particular on uh, two areas, suitability and ESG. Um, first slide, please. So among uh, our main responsibilities as an industry association is to engage with um, Hong Kong regulators in particular regarding topics that uh, impact our members. And um, pretty reliably year in and year out, uh, one of the topics that is most um, impactful to our members is suitability, that is, the question of whether a product is suitable for an individual investor based on his or her needs and risk appetite. Um, and uh, this is something in, in uh, the private wealth management area is, um, is of, of uh, top concern for regulators and, uh, and always impactful for, uh, for private wealth managers. In 2019, in October, uh, the Securities and Futures Commission issued um, new rules around trading in um, so-called complex products. The rules um, require that licensed intermediaries uh, determine whether a transaction in a complex product is suitable for the client in all circumstances. So it's an extension of the existing suitability rules. Uh, and this obligation holds even in the case of unsolicited execution only trades. So that requires intermediaries to determine first and foremost whether or not a product is complex. Um, so in order to come up with a solution for funds in particular, we worked with uh, various partners, including the Hong Kong Investment Funds Association, um, ASIFMA's Asset Managers Group, and uh, most importantly, the Open Funds team to agree on what data fields we needed asset managers to complete in order to identify products as complex or not complex. Next slide, please. Uh, so what you can see here is a list of the data fields that we ultimately agreed upon. Um, the data fields include questions such as, is this a derivative fund under the SFC code on mutual funds and unit trusts? 
Is the fund's investment strategy considered complex? Does the fund invest in instruments without a secondary market, et cetera, et cetera? So um, putting together this list has allowed our members who use this template to get the data that they need in order to make a decision as to whether or not a fund is complex and if it is, whether it is suitable for an individual client. Um, so we are very happy to, to work with uh, open funds on this, um, as well as uh, stakeholders from the asset management um, industry, because frankly, this is the only way that uh, we were able to comply with the new SFC regulations. Um, if we had had to try and determine um, on a case-by-case basis, um, you know, each individual firm left to its own devices, whether or not a product is complex or not complex, simply based on the, um, the SFC's criteria, uh, it would have been a nightmare. Uh, and while it's not exactly um, a dream come true, uh, even with the template, it's certainly a lot easier than it would have been otherwise. Um, next slide, please. So, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was ESG data, and I know um, that there will be a more in-depth discussion on that uh, following my remarks. Um, I will um, focus primarily on just um, uh, a few things. You know, one, the fact that um, there is an increasing interest in ESG investments uh, among private wealth managers and um, among their clients. And you can see that um, from the data on this slide, which um, are all um, from last year's PWMA Private Wealth Management Report. Uh, what you can see here is that 47% of clients who were surveyed for the report reported that they would like to see more than 10% of their portfolios invested in ESG. And of those, nearly half would like to see more than 20% of their portfolios invested in ESG. And meanwhile, among the member firms who were surveyed for this report, um, only about 6% of AUM has more than 10% of their portfolios invested in ESG, but that percentage is expected to rise to 72% in five years' time. And that means that clients and their investment advisors are increasingly dependent on data in order to help identify new sustainable investments for their portfolios and to use as a lens in order to scrutinize the sustainability of their existing portfolios. So uh, what kind of data are they using? Next slide, please. So this slide breaks down the data types into two broad categories core data types and emerging data types. Core data types um, include quantitative reported data such as total carbon emissions, employee turnover, size of the board, et cetera. And uh, this data is often normalized to make the data more easily comparable. Uh, for instance, establishing carbon intensity per unit of revenue. Another core data type is reported policies and programs, such as energy management programs, responsible mining policies, or board independence. These can be assessed uh, on either a linear basis, in other words, does this policy, uh, policy exist or does it not exist, or on a graded basis, how does it compare to peers? And then um, another core data type is controversies such as past lawsuits or penalties related to ESG, which are usually graded by degree of severity. But in addition to these core data types, there's also um, other data types, which um, for lack of a better term, we'll refer to as emerging data types. And those include um, uh, things such as alternative data that can be mined with artificial intelligence, such as ESG related mentions in news media or social media. Um, and it should be noted that there really are no established norms for rating this sort of data. Um, 
another type of emerging data is projected data such as climate risk data which is combined with climate models and geospatial data and again no norms exist but that data is gaining in importance due to both investor and consumer demand uh, as well as regulatory pressure next slide please um, so um, and I, and I don't think this is a controversial comment, but there are big challenges with using ESG data. Um, among them are uh, the lack of common taxonomies. Um, and you heard from Mikkel earlier uh, about the numerous um, tax, taxonomies um, and levels of taxonomies that you have um, in Asia, in uh, Europe, um, and in the US, um, the problem is that uh, they do not always match with each other. Um, there are fundamental differences um, that can exist between these taxonomies, for instance, whether they cover um, climate change, um, environmental risks more widely, or the full set of ESG factors, including um, governance and social issues. Um, for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, um, the EU Taxonomy Regulation, um, and the US SASB Framework all focus on different aspects of ESG. Another challenge is historical data um, that is often provided in ESG databases is by its nature backward-looking. Um, so it doesn't necessarily tell you anything definitive about a firm's ESG policies and what the data might look like in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, another challenge is that projections are always based on assumptions. So when you try to incorporate projections into your calculations, you're faced with the challenge that projections um, are only as reliable as the assumptions uh, that they're based on. So for instance, is it right to assume that a company will meet its stated carbon emissions goals um, and that its progress towards those goals will be linear? Um, and lastly, one cannot assume that reported data is always reliable. Uh, companies have a vested interest in making their numbers look more attractive and numbers which are not subject to regulatory oversight will be more vulnerable to manipulation. So um, these are the challenges that investors face in trying to make use of ESG data. But that said, even with these shortcomings, uh, private wealth management firms are trying to make use of the data that they do have. Some are using multiple data sets rather than relying on one um, and trying to triangulate um, between these different uh, data sets uh, to get at um, something that might be more reliable than would be possible by just relying on one data set. And sometimes they may add a qualitative overlay to offset the shortcomings of a purely quantitative approach. In any case, challenges aren't likely to go away anytime soon. Uh, and private wealth managers and their clients will almost certainly continue to do the best they can with the data available. Um, and with that, um, uh, I will hand it back to Jeff. Thanks, Peter. Our next speaker, Sebastian Brinkman, has more than 15 years of experience across the industry pioneering sustainable investing. Sebastian has worked as a consultant, project manager, and strategist on a multitude of, <clears throat> excuse me, of ESG-related issues, where he has helped institutional investors and asset managers across the globe to understand their data requirements and incorporate new ESG data sets. He joined FE Fund Info from True Value Labs, where he held the position of head of ESG solutions for Europe at the San Francisco headquartered ESG data specialist. <coughs> Sebastian plays a key role in the deepening of FE Fund Info's ESG capabilities as we develop our strategy in line and in response to increased market requirements and client demands. Sebastian works with both new and existing clients to support the development of their ESG approach and address the integration and fulfillment of the associated client and regulatory reporting. 
Again, please submit any questions during the segment in this questions pane, and it's over to you, Sebastian. Good afternoon, and thank you very, very much uh, for having me and giving me an opportunity to, to speak what's a very, very important topic. Uh, and my focus today is, as you'd expect, around um, ESG um, in uh, reporting and the ESG data requirements therein. Um, and uh, speaking a little bit about the different regulatory environments uh, and what we're seeing as the emerging requirements. Uh, and I'll focus principally on what we've seen thus far in, in Europe uh, emerge, develop over the last year or two uh, with the expectation that we'll see similar trends elsewhere. Um, so I'll, I'll um, just set this up by saying that we've basically starting from zero in many regards when it comes to ESG reporting. Yes, there has been some ESG reporting at an institutional level, and by ESG reporting I'm referring to here, ESG reporting at a portfolio level or at a fund level, uh, not necessarily an entity level, not necessarily a uh, a, a glossy ESG report um, or CSR report, but really producing uh, annual key performance indicators uh, for a fund or a portfolio. That hasn't necessarily been something that we've seen too much in the past. We at FE Fund Info have been doing this for a long time, for over 10 years, working with third party data providers to provide such uh, portfolio fund level reports for institutional clients. Uh, but it's not something that's been prescribed, and that's the change uh, that we're seeing now. So we um, click forward in this slide, and we've talked about it already, uh, at, particularly with Mikel giving us an excellent overview of the introduction of a variety of different regulatory frameworks, uh, which have different levels of prescriptiveness in terms of what is expected to be reported, and all of these are essentially coming on stream in the next couple of years, starting in Europe uh, with SFBR and the EU taxonomy reporting and various pieces that go, go together with it. And we'll see following on uh, quickly in the UK as well, uh, and then spreading out regionally. And as mentioned, some of these frameworks are more prescriptive than others. And I'm actually going to focus on, on the EU um, uh, regulations as they are the most prescriptive and perhaps have the most impact uh, in terms of developing trends of what we will expect to see from an ESG reporting perspective in the coming years. Um, just by quick way of background, um, the, the financial reporting in SFDR, the uh, portfolio level or fund level, the uh, product level reporting that's required as part of SFDR is just only one component of an entire sustainable finance framework uh, with the goal of moving assets towards um, uh, sustainable investments, essentially towards uh, transitioning to a greener economy, uh, which is a focus of all of the EU regulations, which focuses on the financial reporting aspect of it, the EU taxonomy, so that's that classification of sustainable activities for corporate issuers and also placing an emphasis on corporate issuers uh, to produce relevant metrics, uh, and this will be a regulatory requirement as well, uh, so that these data elements can then be factored into the investment process. The only um, slight difficulty, that being an understatement, is the sequencing of these various regulations. Uh, with the requirement on the corporate issues to produce this data in Europe, actually lagging the requirement of the financial market participants to produce the uh, sustainability information on their portfolios, which presents itself in data challenges, um, uh, which Peter has spoken to already, and that will persist um, in Europe and then, of course, elsewhere where we don't have those, uh, um, those requirements on corporate issuers at this moment. Um, nonetheless, I will move on to the next slide. Uh, SFDR is a very, very important and huge step uh, in terms of the level of transparency and disclosure around the ESG characteristics of a portfolio. Uh, and I'm talking about it really just to highlight 
uh, the different data elements that one will see and one will come to expect to see elsewhere, uh, the different ESG data elements and key performance indicators that you could expect to see at a portfolio, uh, at a product level. Uh, and this will, this will range from setting forth uh, the methodology and the key targets within a fund and a portfolio that you will expect to see in pre-contractual uh, disclosures through to then very, very granular key performance indicators uh, in the periodic reports. Uh, so on an annual basis, be a fund that is targeting certain sustainable development goals or a certain um, uh, carbon emissions threshold, uh, a certain warming scenario, um, if it's targeting certain uh, investments that are EU taxonomy aligned, these will all be data elements that need to be clearly reported on on an annual basis. And another key factor of what is called the principal adverse impact uh, which lists a series of uh, 16 areas where uh, funds have to then produce uh, key data on what are potentially negative impacts, neg negative environmental social impacts of investments in certain companies and activities, uh, which goes to that core um, element of double materiality uh, that is a, a central tenant of the, the European regulations. So this is just to emphasize the level of granularity of ESG data that is now uh, beginning to flow through into fund level, portfolio level disclosures in Europe. Uh, and these are also for global portfolios. We're seeing um, US managers, uh, Asian managers that are marketing funds in Europe now also developing these disclosures uh, as required for anything that is marketed, distributed in Europe. Um, that, so that's one piece of the SFDR disclosures that flow through in, uh, as I've mentioned, in pre-contractual and periodic reports, which are essentially in fund prospectuses and fund annual reports. Another key element is how is this data actually getting through to the hands of distributors? And if we go to the next slide, I want to touch upon briefly something that's called the European ESG template, um, which is essentially uh, an electronic version. It's a spreadsheet version of SFDR. It is an attempt by the industry to capture all of those data elements that I've just mentioned uh, through the, the, the run through of SFDR within a spreadsheet format. And the purpose of this is really uh, to facilitate the entry of this data uh, into um, uh, uh, fund selection databases at the distributor level um, and so that distributors can meet their requirements as part of the other piece of European regulation, financial regulation MIFID, which now requires all advisors to ascertain the sustainability preferences of their clients. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge undertaking um, to be able to capture all of these data elements within a spreadsheet and then to place that requirement on market participants to fill this out. Uh, but uh, it is industry standard. Uh, it will become industry standard. Um, and uh, this is the Pindatex format. And we're now expecting to see, uh, as we've had that excellent overview of, of open funds from Charlie, uh, this week, I know the team's been working on this, but we're expecting to see this now come through in the open format, funds format as well. Uh, and so we are now seeing clients deliver their first EETs uh, so that uh, distributors can then capture all of that valuable ESG data uh, uh, within the EET. The, just to give you a sense of the scale of the reporting requirements, there are over 600 fields that could potentially be filled uh, within the European ESG template. Um, and that covers essentially all the entire myriad of different ESG data points uh, that one would ex could uh, potentially expect to see in an SFDR report, depending on the characteristics of the fund. Uh, so just quickly to recap on that, and I think this is useful. And if we go to the next slide, I think this is uh, useful uh, for the purposes of understanding how the market is ingesting ESG data and how it's producing ESG uh, data. So you have uh, two sides of this equation, those that need to provide 
uh, the European ESG template or ESG template, ESG data in a um, spreadsheet format. Uh, and those are essentially the fund manufacturers, the product manufacturers. And if you are a product manufacturer that is competing uh, to get their ESG product chosen versus a competitor's, um, you will obviously need to have a very, very clear ESG integration strategy, clear targets for, um, for the ESG characteristics of a fund, but you'll need to be able to communicate this in various forms. And one of this, these is through the um, ESG template or another regional template that may exist. So in the UK, we're seeing the carbon emissions template as well. Um, so one can have the best uh, uh, thought through ESG policy strategy uh, fund with a long history, but if you're not able to communicate this uh, through the various different formats, including the European ESG template, in a, what is a very, very competitive marketplace for ESG funds as well, then you run the risk of your fund not being selected because distributors are going to be, a, are going to be ingesting EETs and we at FE Fund Info are seeing the demand for the EET already commencing uh, as they will rely on these files, these spreadsheets, these templates to be able to uh, populate their databases, their fund databases with relevant information and be able to match ESG funds with the sustainability preferences of their clients. Um, so not to be overlooked are these different methodologies or different mechanisms rather for distributors ingesting fund level ESG data. That being said, and we'll move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> The European ESG template is not the only way that ESG data will be uh, consumed. Uh, and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, in a brief moment of different ways that you can help, you can um, communicate ESG data. Uh, but it means that there is a lot to stay on top of. Um, and this is a, a really, really challenging time uh, for, for fund manufacturers uh, to essentially stay on top of all of the different regulatory requirements laid out before you have uh, variations across uh, regions. Yes, there is a, a lot of overlap in what is required. Yes, the data will be a lot, uh, a very, very similar. So um, uh, carbon emissions data being reported won't necessarily vary too much from one region uh, to the next, but the levels of prescriptiveness and the different types of data that could be required will vary from one region to the next. Um, and so it's going to be a big challenge, particularly for those products that are marketed in different regions to be, stay on top of those regulatory requirements uh, uh, and ensure that they're essentially conforming to those, um, those requirements. And then to be able to execute on that, on the different types of files that uh, are required to talk about the EET, you have the CET, you have the different SFDR documents, and this is just in Europe. Um, and so our clients are seeing a big, big challenge in being able to meet all of these different requirements and essentially that they uh, are filling out these documents as they need to be filled out and then make, ensuring that they get distributed to the right place. Um, and so that's something that um, is very, very core cool to what we do at our uh, FE Fund Info to help our clients um, with this. But one other key element that I think is worth touching on, uh, and we'll move to the next slide, and not just necessarily um, uh, these core regulatory requirements that we're seeing in Europe now and that we're seeing emerging in, in Asia and the US, um, but also is the understanding and that we're seeing this as a trend in the marketplace that the end consumer is particularly in the retail space is not necessarily going to pour over an SFDR document or uh, receive an EET file. Uh, yes, the distributors, the advisors will rely on these, uh, on these data points to be able to match funds or select funds, but in terms of investment literature that the end consumer is going to uh, read and the way it will consume ESG data, 
uh, will likely be in more traditional formats in terms of a fund fact sheet, for example, or perhaps a standalone ESG document. And we're definitely seeing that as a trend in the marketplace, particularly on the fund fact sheet side, where uh, funds will be appending a page or two pages of what they consider as the core ESG data elements uh, for that particular fund, or for that particular group of stakeholders that they're targeting. Um, so if a fund is targeting uh, a certain uh, emissions reduction scenario or trying to communicate it's not investing in certain negative activities such as cluster munitions or thermal coal or whatever it may be, or that it's targeting investments in the sustainable development goals, uh, that they want to be able to graphically represent that uh, in a standalone fact sheet or appended to a, a financial fact sheet. Um, so um, we're definitely seeing that as a trend, but that also brings with it a certain degree of, of risk uh, around aligning those disclosures according to the regulatory disclosure requirements as well. Uh, so if you're in Europe and you're producing your SFDR documentation um, and you're producing now an ESG fact sheet, you'll obviously need to ensure that the data is the same from one report to the other, otherwise you're actually incurring some level of regulatory risk. And then the other final big risk which we've seen emerge, and we'll go to the, the next slide, uh, is that of greenwashing. So um, it's is a, something that we've seen as, a, as been highlighted recently. Uh, regulators are becoming increasingly um, wary of, of greenwashing. You saw that as the focus now in the SEC as part of their, their, their regulations. Uh, Mick touched upon it as well in terms of the Hong Kong regulations. Uh, this is a big area of concern and focus for, for, for regulators. Um, and we've had examples such as uh, Deutsche in, in Germany, BNY Mellon, where the regulators have stepped in uh, because they've seen incidences or, or at least what looks like strong evidence of greenwashing of financial products. Um, so, so there again, the need to align the disclosures with what's actually in the financial product, what's in the regulatory disclosures is, is critical and will be uh, just a key area of risk management within our industry uh, in the coming years, particularly given the growth of ESG products, i.e. those that have been labelled and marketed as ESG. And this, this slide ends here, basically uh, emphasising that in Europe, certainly, this is a big focus of the regulators. They've targeted um, greenwashing in their roadmap for the next two years, um, both in terms of monitoring greenwashing and building up the capacity of the local authorities uh, to be able to, to safeguard against greenwashing. Um, so that would be my concluding comment really, is to be aware of all of the different regulatory requirements in different regions. Um, I think it presents an opportunity as well in terms of being able to uh, uh, differentiate one's product both by having clear, concise, transparent, uh, uh, regulatory aligned ESG reporting and being able to get that out to the market, get data out through these different mechanisms out to the market uh, so that um, your fund products can be selected. Uh, so with that, I think that concludes my piece of the presentation. I'll hand it back over to Jeff. Thanks, Sebastian. That was the perfect segue to our panel discussion. Today, I'm pleased to have with me Frederick Chu. Frederick is the executive director at Haitong International Asset Management, responsible for ETF business development. Frederick has over 20 years of experience in the financial industry. He was recently the head of ETFs at China EMC Hong Kong, leading the ETF franchise and managing the firm's ETF and index business and strategies in Hong Kong and overseas. Uh, prior to that, Frederick worked at HSFBC Security Services as a senior vice president, covering Korea and Hong Kong QFI institutional investors. He also held various front office positions at investment banks, including Credit Suisse, Societe Generale, as well as Lehman Brothers in the prime services business. Uh, we also have Hilary Su. Hilary joined Invest Tal in 2019 and is currently responsible for the fund distribution and institutional client relations across EMEA with a focus on the UK. 
Prior to Investow, she was equity sales in Maybank Kim Eng, Everbright Sun Hong Kai, and Haitong Securities in London, where she was in charge of the company's corporate access to Chinese listed companies. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Uh, before that, she worked for KPMG in London, advising multinational corporates on market entry risks in emerging markets. And then we also have Shelley Yu. Shelley Yu is the vice president, ESG and climate specialist at MSCI. Shelley has extensive experience from both buy and sell sides, including at HSBC, Goldman Sachs, and Schroeder's. Prior to joining MSCI, Shelley worked at HSBC for nine years, where she spearheaded key strategic initiatives, including China Belt and Road, Allocate to China, Greater Bay Areas, and Euro-Asia Business Corridors. She was also the chairperson of HSBC China Connect and has been ranked number 32 in the FT Yahoo Finance Empowered Top 100 Ethnic Minority Executives of 2019. Welcome all, and thank you for joining our panel session today. I'll first ask each panelist to give us a quick introduction on their companies and business, and then we'll jump into discussing the topic, how are groups integrating sustainability, sustainability factors, factors in the fund distribution? distribution. Uh, Frederick, uh, I'll, start, Frederick, with I'll start with you. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Frederick. I'm Frederick. Uh, I'm Frederick. Uh, I cover uh, the uh, ETF business act here in Haitong. I uh, appreciate a very detailed uh, introduction of mine. Um, so Haitong, it's a... Um, full service uh, financial institutions where we offer uh, ranges from uh, asset management to uh, wealth management, capital markets and investment banking. Uh, we're based in Hong Kong as the international hub of the group. Uh, asset management as being one of the uh, strategic business line for the firm, uh, we mainly facilitate uh, both internal and external investors, um, uh, clients. Uh, on the ETF side, we have been on uh, we have been in this area for uh, quite some years, uh, to be honest, uh, and uh, we think that uh, in this uh, you know uh, difficult market situation uh, and, um, and, uh, and and the trend uh, uh, in the in the investment industry, uh, beta will be a uh, very dominant space, uh, and then uh, it's it's you know uh, always been a good time to uh, deep dive into this. Thanks, Frederick. Hillary, can you make an introduction of yourself? Yeah, hi. It's a huge pleasure and privilege to be um, part of the panel and witness lots of really insightful and interesting discussion today. So my name is Hilary Su. I work for Investow Limited. We are a cross-border um, distribution boutique based in London, Zurich, and Shanghai. Um, it's a very interesting time to be part of the distribution, fund distribution, and cross-border distribution industry, um, witnessing a lot of the you know, challenges, but also um, opportunities um, in, in the sector. Um, we work exclusively with the Chinese asset manager and European asset managers. So we have a, I'd like to think we have a very unique insight into how the fund landscape um, has been sort of shaping and reshaping um, across um, these two really important regions. So it's, uh, you know, very, very, um, I, I think it's a privilege to be here today and have this conversation with you all. Thanks, Hilary. And Shelley, if you could uh, introduce yourself quickly. Uh, yes, sure. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for uh, a great introduction already. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, I, uh, uh, I work in the uh, climate and ESG climate coverage uh, at MSCI and uh, tasked for the responsibility of uh, expanding uh, our uh, presence uh, in uh, Greater China uh, with, you know, uh, uh, responding to the increasing demand uh, in the market. Uh, so uh, uh, very honored and pleased to be here uh, today, join this uh, uh, great panel discussion. Thanks, Shelley. So now onto our topic today is integrating sustainability factors and fund distribution. This topic is obviously becoming increasingly important. And as we've heard today with the changes in reporting and disclosure requirements, it's an area of focus across the industry. So our first question is, what are the major trends in ESG and sustainable investing in APAC, EU, and the UK? And do you think harmonization across the different fund jurisdictions is possible in the future given different stages they are in, in terms of understanding and implementation of ESG regulation? Um, I'll start off with you, Shelley. Uh, thank you, uh, very interesting question. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, in terms of uh, key ESG trends, uh, we are seeing increased uh, ESG adoption throughout the uh, entire financial ecosystem. Uh, as investors and the corporations are increasingly aware of how ESG factors can affect the long-term risk and return of their investments. This is reflected in the, uh, uh, the numbers um, uh, for example, ESG assets globally are expected to exceed $53 trillion by 2025, representing more than a third of the projected total asset under management, which is about $140 trillion. Um, Europe has uh, demonstrated a clear leader, accounts for uh, half of the global ESG assets, while the U.S. has um, had the strongest expansion and Asia has shown great uh, momentum and could be the driver of the next wave of growth, in particular Japan and China. As we see, Asian investors has, uh, becoming, have becoming more and more active in pursuing ESG investments, with more than two thirds of the institutional investors indicating increased interest in ESG. The total ESG assets in Asia have also grown uh, from a mere $800 million uh, in 2019 to uh, $7.9 billion. Meanwhile, uh, climate change has uh, overtaken governance and the social issues at the top of the ESG agenda, reflecting both the existential threat of global temperature rise and the race against uh, time to rein it in. At a company level, corporates are pushing corporates for net zero supply chains, so called the new Amazon effect, as everyone buys from Amazon, but who does uh, Amazon buy from? Uh, in corporate uh, uh, boardrooms around the world, uh, the effort to set net zero goals has spark sparked a common topic, what do we do with our suppliers? As the world's largest companies strive to achieve net zero emissions, downward pressure on suppliers' uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions also increase. At the country level, on the back of COP26, countries are increasingly committing to net zero targets within the next 50 years. In the last 18 months, we've seen visible changes across the world, and in particular, the APAC region, where tighter uh, regulation, rising corporate awareness, and more uh, pressure from investors has led to a step up in overall ESG performance. And this is uh, also accelerated by China's uh, 3060 double carbon uh, targets. And um, lastly, with regard to uh, harmonization in regulation, um, so are we going to hear more acronyms <laughs> such as the TCFD, SFD, RNGFS? Well, the answer is yes and no. Uh, with at least 34 regulatory bodies and the standard setters in 12 markets undertaking official consultation on ESG in 2021 alone, we see convergence in some core areas, yet um, there are signs of further fragmentation driven by different re regional uh, priorities. For example, on matters of uh, objectives, virtually all proposed rules we analyze to seek to uh, uh, enable transparency. Whilst the uniformity of reporting, the EU favors the data templates, while other regions show a mix of approaches. Uh, on definitions of materiality, however, uh, it, forms of, uh, it forms one of the uh, clearest uh, fault lines. So, uh, for example, the Sing Singapore, Japan have focused on disclosures, while um, whilst the UK, EU, Hong Kong explicitly uh, include disclosures on broader social impact, sometimes referred to as a double materiality. So, such differences could prove to be a persistent obstacle to global convergence on ESG-related regulations. And with that, I'll pass on to uh, Frederick for further uh, elaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, you know, I think when we talk about ESG in Asia, uh, we first of all we we all understand that uh, ESG first being pioneered in in Europe, uh, starting from the, the the Nordic countries, and it, you know it has been like 10, 15 years time uh, where you know Europe has been slowly developed into 
uh, today in, in the sense of the sophistication of uh, whether it be in ESG complying or ESG investing. Uh, Asia, it's very much behind uh, in terms of the lifespan. Uh, although we have been you know, spending a lot of time uh, following up this global push uh, where we have to follow this uh, particular uh, you know, principle in all as aspects of the, of the business operation as well as the investment management. Now, I, I think we, we all need to, first of all, uh, appreciate the fact that Asia is a scattered landscape. Um, every country is pretty much standalone. Uh, you know, we have we have our own market assets, we have our own currency, uh, restricted currencies, we have our own jurisdiction regulations, and so so on and so forth. So it's it's not very much similar to, uh, let's say, Europe, whereas you know EU has uh, you know a very unified uh, compliance uh, you know environment, or the US is very dominant in the Americas. But Asia, we have Japan, uh, China, for instance. When we talk about China. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's very much to do. I, th I think yes, it's very much to do with the culture aspects of that particular jurisdiction. Uh, for instance, in China, we probably care more about the environment, uh, the environment, than uh, the other two pillars of the of the uh, of the ESG. Uh, Japan might have the same uh, you know similarities. When you look back at Southeast Asia, they probably more weight on social responsibility than the other the other aspects so it, it's it's a little bit different here and there and i think um you you, you ask whether you know the harmonization across uh the region on esg I, I think this has to be looked at differently uh than eu and us um in these two continents yes a harmonization it's probably works better than, than than anything else. But in Asia, because of the different cultural uh, and market assets, and et cetera, I, I think it probably be more tailor-made into the particular culture and particular landscape of that particular market will work best for Asia. Now, then it comes to, um, uh, on, on the regulations front, uh, now, I, I think ESG is both a top-down and a bottom-up. Top down from the government level, they have to, you know, via, um, you know, uh, 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 penalizing investment uh, investment that are not being ESG, and then bottom up uh, from the from the investors aspect uh, to make them aware why they have to do impact investing and so on and so forth. Um, but then, you know, currently I think the regulation has been uh, putting a lot of, you know, uh, attentions uh, into the uh, investment managers area uh, where, you know. Uh, you know, for instance, in Hong Kong, you have to comply with uh, from the board and management level down to, you know, your investment philosophy. Uh, but then we have to understand that the whole ESG spectrum, it's an ecosystem which comprises of corporates, which are the companies who are strive to do better, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to do better business op uh, uh, operation for a better world. Uh, and then, you know, the, the regulators, how do they govern uh, all, all these business of operations and make sure make sure that they're that they're walking the talks and then investment uh, managers like us who are make sure that in our stock selections we are actually picking the ones that are doing better uh, you know for a better sense and then finally the investors who are being made aware of why do they have to invest into the you know the the uh, the uh, uh, carbon neutral or the, any 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 form of uh, of investment like that so I don't think there's any uh any one of these um these uh, 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 uh particular peoples here uh within the ecosystem can stand alone and say i'm going to drive esg and to make it successful you know it, it has to be a collective effort uh, when the whole market it's, it's it's being aware of that um i think the uh the uh, uh investment managers uh, are now facing um you know various uh uh, challenges uh, or you know uh, putting over a lot of efforts in complying with the regulations uh, but at the same time I think uh, th there are a lot of different aspects we need to work out uh, for instance uh, the data source that, that you need to make sure that you know you have enough information uh, with regards to uh, uh, the, your, your portfolio of companies or the investment that you choose um, and you need to have, uh, you know, uh, intelligence. You need need to have uh, talents who are really understands on how to analyze all these data and how to, uh, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, uh, a precise uh, uh, judgments over 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 um, uh, all these all these uh, uh, selected companies. And then the investment managers who are actually dealing with two fronts. Uh, first of all, they have to make sure that the portfolio 
are you know uh, up to a certain standard. But at the same time, uh, I don't think the investors will be willing to see the, a, a you know a, a big compromise in terms of the investment returns. So it, it's like I said, it, it's not about the how much the asset manager can do or you know how much the regulators can push, but it's, it has to do with the entire. Uh, commu investment community, uh, uh, in order, you know, in a collective effort. Thanks, Frederick. Um, Hillary, your thoughts on on the question that I had? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think Frederick has uh, already alluded to the genesis of uh, ESG in Europe. Um, so I think I want to take some time to share some um, data on inflows in ESG UK and Europe, because I wanted to highlight just the growth and potential of the industry. Um, the total sustainable assets in the UK right now is around 56 billion pounds. Um, in last year alone, the inflow into sustainable assets were more than 37 billion. It is quite significant because uh, well, when you realize that last year, the net uh, market inflow to the whole of the UK was already, you know, was only 27 billion. So, and um, in the year of COVID, so back in 2020, um, ESG funds in the UK were bringing in new client money on average, 1 billion pounds per month. Um, that was the time when, you know, all of the investors suddenly realized that ESG um, does help you reinforce against risk um, during the kind of a black swan type of situation. Uh, right now, more than 40% of all fund industry sales in the UK are ESG fund units. Um, I don't have the Q2 data yet, but um, um, for Q1 this year, um, the ESG equity fund flows in the UK has reached a record high level again um, at a billion pounds. Um, this is investors taking um, money from a, uh, 10 billion pounds of a non-ESG equity position. Um, similar stories can also be said about the bond market, but on a much smaller scale. Um, Shelia has already mentioned about how Europe dominates the space, and absolutely, you know, it's the case. Um, Europe has the world's largest climate fund market with a total AUM um, just slightly over um, $320 billion. Um, in addition to very high inflows in continental Europe, the European market also leads the space in ESG fund development, um, product launching, and etc. Um, the introduction of uh, SFDR last year, of course, was a very important milestone in our industry. Because of that, investor must develop a better understanding of a climate profile, not just for the corporates you're invested in, but also the companies you're in, uh, the countries that you're invested in. But how we are doing, how, how we go about this um, is quite slightly different between the UK and the continental market. Um, the UK wants to champion a uh, what they call principle-led ESG approach. So by that, we mean, you know, we want to see more thematic strategies, we want to see more principle investing, and hopefully there will be more outcome-oriented solutions, as opposed to just comparing sharp ratios between funds and et cetera. Um, insofar, the European market still follows a, a regulation-led approach. Um, of course, that approach has its own distinctive advantage because you can drive up the flow very easily. Um, the reporting standard has been covered by Sebastian and some of, some of my other colleagues already, so I won't go into um, uh, and that. But I think based on my conversation with other industry um, uh, people, um, there's definitely going to be some kind of a, a reckoning um, in the future when it comes to reporting procedure. We're going to find a way to um, streamline the reporting procedure just like how we you know, streamlined accounting standards many years ago. So in the near future, I do, I, do, I do feel like there is going to be more standardization in reporting so that our industry can expect more um, sophistication professionalism. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, thanks Hilary. And uh, on to our next question uh, is, what do you think the biggest change in the fund landscape is going to be over the next five years? And how is it influencing fund distribution? Uh, and we'll start with Frederick. And and just to let you know, we only have about 10 minutes left for for, for today's uh, webinar. So apologies that we uh, you know have time constraints. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I think uh, we we're going to see a more investors driven market. Uh, uh, with that, what I'm saying is uh, the the autonomy of the investors will be coming bigger and bigger. 
um, they will have a more decisive, uh, you know, um, uh, power in terms of, you know, making their own investment decisions. Uh, you know, Peter talked about, you know, suitability. I, I, th I think there was a lot of reason uh, attributing to, to, what I, to what I believe. Uh, suitability could be one of them. I mean, we will always talk about like suitability um, to be a responsibility of the distributor or a responsibility actually from the investors. I think suitability has come in the two fronts. One is, you know, the, the, the professional judgment from the intermediaries as well as the investor's education. Now, the general investor's education, you know, can be, can be good, can be bad, but, you know, that there's always clashes in between what the investors understand the, you know, the, the level of risk that they can, they can take or, or the, the suitable product that they can engage into, uh, as opposed to, uh, uh what the intermediaries think, uh, for instance, uh, like any of the individuals invested in Hong Kong, uh, who trade, uh, you know, warrants that let's, let's say it's a warrants, how many of them actually understand the complex mechanism behind the warrants? you know, maybe less than 10%, maybe less than, you know, 20%, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to define how you, how you, how, how you um, actually think uh, the, the suitability is. Now with that, I think, how do they, how, how does the investors be, being as, as, a, as an institution or, or, or individual investors, um, it will be depending very much on uh, the, uh, the data. So how much data that they can get to help them to facilitate uh, uh, their, their, their investment decisions. And then uh, at, at the same time, I think uh, the digitaliza uh, digitalization of the uh, investment intelligence, it's also going to be uh, coming to play a lot, a lot more than that. Um, uh, from the product perspective, from the investment uh, uh, perspective, uh, I do believe ESG is going to be uh, becoming more and more aware, uh, you know, among, among general investors, uh, you know, both institutional and, and, and in individual investors. Uh, we have been seeing uh, from the, from at least from the, you know, the, the, the Hong Kong market perspective, uh, more and more investors is, is coming to uh, interested in knowing what the what the ESG uh, is all about. What, what does it do, and what does it mean to me? What does it mean to the the, the, the bigger community? Uh, one example is is that we have uh, recently started working with a uh, very sizable uh, Hong Kong wealth managers, and they opened up a um, green themed channel that they pull it pull up you know active and passive ETFs uh, under the broader you know green theme uh, being as ESG or carbon neutral and then they came they came to us for you know a selection of products as as we uh, you know we, we putting pretty much uh, attention into into managing ESG products so I think uh, this we, we're going to see this uh, a, a lot more and finally I think um, uh, another aspect will be on the robo advisors uh, the robo advisors I always say at least from ETF perspective uh, they are, you know, developing into, uh, you know, uh, uh, simulations, whereas investors can run their own simulation before they actually, you know, uh, decide on whether a portfolio is suitable for them. So I think all these technology, uh, uh, you know, data and, you know, uh, uh, stuff together will, will be uh, uh, helping to drive the, uh, you know, investor dominant market. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, Hillary? Um, great. I think I'll just um, focus on product and distribution for um, the changes in those two areas in the next five years. Um, I absolutely agree with Frederick. I think the market um, for, you know, on the products that is definitely going to be investor led. Um, I think there is going to be a strong product diversification into the social impact funds that reflect the S in S. Uh, ESG. Um, you know, some of you probably have already heard about the, you know, 30 trillion wealth transfer story from the boomers generation to millennial and Gen Z. Um, in the UK alone, in the next 30 years, we are going to expect 5.5 trillion of wealth being, you know, trickled down to the next generation. Um, the demand for advice will increase. The millennial generations, their earning power is going to increase 75% um, in the next few years. Uh, these people are going to uh, need advice and uh, they will be looking to buy funds that reflect their ethos, their social political ambition. Um, it's down to our fund managers to capture that kind of a demand. And it's down to our fund selectors and wealth managers to help to make sure that we have such type of social impact funds onto their um, platform and pipeline. In terms of uh, um, distribution, 
Um, I think the biggest difference between the continent of Europe and U the UK market is that um, distribution in Europe is still largely rely on banks, insurance companies, large institutions have a huge leeway in making market difference there versus the UK is uh, largely um, advisory led, um, especially now in the UK, is, there is a you know, massive increase on passive products. So platforms are going to get a large uh, chunk uh, in a dis distribution market in the next few years. Um, I, I, I do believe there's going to be more third party funds available um, across all kinds of platforms. And I do think there's going to be more consolidation within the uh, within our industry in the next few years because of uh, you know cost and the regulation. So that's some input from me. Thanks, Larry. Shelley? Yes, uh, very well said uh, by both uh, Frederick and uh, uh, Hillary. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, add a little bit more uh, in terms of uh, the uh, strategic uh, policy shift uh, in some of the APAC uh, countries. Uh, for example, uh, in China, uh, the uh, policymakers are, you know, are aiming to tackle the emerging uh, environmental and social issues. Um, so uh, sustainable and equitable uh, development uh, rather than uh, um, uh, growth at all costs is taking uh, central stage. Uh, the other uh, theme that uh, is transforming the fund industry uh, landscape is uh, the transition to, uh, to net zero, which uh, obviously we already uh, you know, discussed quite a bit uh, uh, earlier. So uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, move back to you, Jeff, for the, the final question. Sure. Um, we, we won't have much time for the last question, but um, so how are asset managers preparing for the challenges in ESG and climate risk reporting requirements? And I'll start off with Hillary. Um, I think, you know, um, data quality and greenwashing have already been covered by our colleagues before. So I think I'll just add a few comments on, you know, we, you know, our, our ESG ecosystem is still growing. We just need to make sure that we keep um, pursuing the standards and engage stakeholders and make sure that we have a very good standard um, on disclosure. And we have to make sure that we have ESG implemented in all layers of analysis, uh, you know, company as the managers, we, in, in addition to their portfolio position performance, we have to look at their, for example, male-female ratio on their board. Um, is the company doing charity work outside? Do they have genuine ESG policy in place? Um, so there are a lot of the uh, you know, layers of analysis can go into ESG that help us or e e help us enrich our understanding about the company we're invested in. Um, also, a last bit of a comment I would like to add is that uh, you know we should we, we should have a good talent pipeline in ESG analysis uh, in asset management. Um, I think so far from my observation, I very often just see one or two ESG analysts supporting the whole uh, research desk. If uh, we want to see the industry flourish, we have to make sure that we have more um, you know, ESG talent in the pipeline to help support this whole industry um, and, and ecosystem. Thanks, Hillary. Uh, Frederick? Yeah, I, I think uh, from an ETF perspective, I think ET, the way that ETF is managed is very, very much different from an active funds. On active funds, you you can you can put in you know a lot of uh, proprietary judgments uh, and analysis, but then on the ETF side, uh, it's always a rule based. Um, so it, most of the time, it's, it's a rule based, uh, and whether it's it's an ESG uh, ETF, conventional ETFs, uh, you know the the index company. Uh, which you know some of the very uh, well-established index companies like MSCI, they do have a very well-established, long uh, history uh, type of mechanisms that apply to different uh, countries, different markets, in, in different themes. Um, so I think the fine-tuning of the ESG components that make it integrated into a rule-based index type of uh, mechanism, it has to work more and more closely in between the issuer and the index providers, which means that the, the, the issuer will need to understand themselves what are they really you know, engaging within the ESG aspect that they want to put into the rules. And on the other front, the index companies will also have to uh, you know, probably give it a little, bit, a, a little bit more leeway in terms of you know, uh, tweaking the, 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 uh, the data or the, or the methodology uh, to make it a little bit more customized uh, in terms of the various aspects within within ESG. Great, thanks, Frederick. And Shelley, your, your thoughts? Uh, you have a couple minutes. 
<laughs> yes, Sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I wanted to thank Frederick for mentioning <laughs> MSCI. Of course, I just wanted to end this uh, by saying that we do offer comprehensive data sets and analytic, uh, analytics tools to support institutional investors in terms of understanding and uh, quantifying climate related, related risks and opportunities and in complying the framework, particularly in regard to uh, carbon uh, footprinting, as well as the scenario analysis and the portfolio alignment. So, um, so with that, uh, I know that we probably overrunning our time. And uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, yeah, for, uh, for, you know, for the discussion. Okay, great. So that concludes all today's official proceedings for today's webinar. And thank you for joining us and all to our speakers and our panelists. And thank you for being part of such an insightful and topical session. Um, I wish we had more time, but you know, before I let you go, uh, please don't forget to provide your feedback on today's event. Um, you'll receive a follow-up email shortly with a link to a short survey and also the recording of today's session. Um, lastly, if you do have any questions on the updates that we shared today, um, you know, if we want to continue this, this conversation, please email events at fefundinfo.com and we could try to you know, facilitate any questions that you might have. And so um, we look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person next year. And I really appreciate Thank you for attending and then also joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank